highlights. You know, I just have to say, I like the Bible. I think it's cool. Um, you know, not just because I'm a pastor, but because um, it's, it's pretty awesome. Isn't it? You know, I mean, seriously. Uh, you know, I think that uh, for the last several months and weeks, we've been in this Hero Challenge series. And, and as we're kind of coming to a, uh, a landing place on it, um, I am just going to convey some things that are on, on my heart. You know, one of, the, one of the truths that has really resonated for me is the, is the reality that Scripture is not a set of, of rules or information that basically hold us back from the best possible life. Indeed, it's just, it's just the opposite. I mean, Scripture is a entrance. It is an opening into this beautiful harmony and music that has been going on forever and ever, that when we take listen to it, it gives us the opportunity to come into harmony to the very best possible way to live. I love what I read there at the end of 1 Corinthians 12, right? I'm going to show you the best way to live of all, and he hits us with love. And so sometimes our idea of this book right here is a rule book, as opposed to a harmony that allows us to take listen and tune in and be able to hear the music and to hear the rhythm. I like it because it helps me to kind of get a picture of it. And how many of you know it is nice when music is in harmony and in, in rhythm, right? And when it's out of rhythm, when musical instruments are out of tune, how many of you know it isn't that exciting? <laughs> in fact, it's terrible. And the truth is, is that when we begin to adapt and we begin to understand Scripture in that context and in that framework, and we begin to take listen, and we, and we begin to ask God to give us a new way to look at what he talks about and what he says, and we understand that his heart is love for us, unconditional love and favor and grace, we can then trust it and ask for a different perspective because everything he gives to us is there because of wisdom and understanding of the best possible way to live life, right? He tells us, and I always say this just as a point, he says, husbands, love your wives in this sacrificial way. Why? Because it's going to be good for you in a lot of ways. Sorry, it is. When you serve that way. And adultery is not going to allow you to have the best possible relationship. This isn't, oh my, wow, this is really complex. No, because he says the effort and energy that you put into that relationship steals from yours. Real tough, right? I mean, this is, this is uh, not, not rocket science. And everything that we come back to through Scripture is about his wisdom and his desire for us to lead and to live the best possible life. When it comes to relationships, this is where it's at. Woo, woo. I mean, this is it. And I want to open uh, up to a passage of Scripture that is really for us, uh, for E3 Church at this, at this time. I believe it is obviously a, um, uh, contextually it is, it is about a situation that, that mirrors ours as we begin to make some transitions here at E3 over the next couple of weeks. But more importantly, I believe it's God's heartbeat for the church. And Paul is writing, and if you, if you look at what the scripture has to say about the church, over and over and over and over again, there is one thing that sticks out, and it is God's desire and passion for the church to be unified, united, for there to be unity. And in Romans 14, Paul is dealing with some difficulty that's taking place in churches. They're, they're, they're in disarray, they're in a, 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 a struggle, and there's some things that come up that are very apropos for today, and I believe that are going to help us um, in understanding really God's desire for his church, because it's his, isn't it? And how many of you know what church is? It's people. It's people. And the first half of Romans 14 is is a, a reframe. Someone said it's Romans 14 is divided into two refrains. And the first half is, is a call to the church to refrain from judging others. And the second half is a refrain from offending each other. 
So the first half deals with having the right attitude towards each other, and then the second half talks about the right kind of actions. Now, I usually preface as we dive into the best possible way to live, us taking an understanding of where God is leading us. God's desire is to lead us, right, to the very best possible way to live life. His desire is that we would experience the the fullest joy, the most favor, the best relationships, the best marriages, the best friendships. God is is doing that. So as we read through these passages, I want you to uh, pay close attention to realize that God is speaking to us to lead us. Everyone say, lead me. To lead us into the best possible life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go ahead and start with Romans 14 real quick, verse 1. It says, except other believers who are weak in faith, don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables, vegetarians, and vegans. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't, and those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. In the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, whatever, while others think that every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor him. Those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord since they give thanks to God before eating. Those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's honor the Lord. And if we die, it's honor the Lord. So whether we live or we die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be Lord both of the living And of the dead, verse 10, why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me, and every tongue will confess and give praise to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Again, verse 13, so let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. And then he goes into verse 19 to sort of sum it all up. And he says, so then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. So there's obviously some things going on that Paul is dealing with. And there's three D words that will help you to associate. He's dealing with diet. He's dealing with days. And he is, we didn't go through it, but he's dealing with drink. So the church, and I'm not sure if you have ever been to a variety of churches, but this is the case even to this day. Everybody has a different way of doing things, right? And everybody, not, I mean, in their heart, I don't think this is true, but sometimes we have this idea that we want everyone to believe like we believe, to think like we think, and to drink like we drink, don't we? Okay, you admitted it. Some of you, the others, are not sure. But in reality, we really don't want that. We don't want to attend a place where everybody is exactly the same, dresses the same, smells the same, thinks the same, because what ends up happening is we become a church of robots rather than a group of people who have free will and expression and personalities, right, and individual giftings that allow us to be the very church that God came to establish a group of messed up individuals who are surrendered to the love and to the hope of God who are giving what they have from their hearts. And so Paul gives us some instruction though. He gives us some instruction. He says, one one version says, let's concentrate on the things that make for harmony. Everyone say harmony. And, And on the growth of our fellowship together. Another translation says, we must always aim at those things that bring peace and help strengthen one another. In other words, there are certain things that come up that just don't really matter. But he gives us instructions on how to operate and how to act because he knows that what Paul, speaking to this church and the church, 
He knows that what God desires is a church that is unified and united because when a group of people put down all of the minutia and get busy on loving people in a real and tangible way, stuff starts to get real in this Whole Foods parking lot. It's a reference to something else. Don't worry about it. When a group of people begin to understand the very heartbeat of what the church is and they begin to recognize it first and foremost, God's desire is that we would begin to build up one another, encourage one another, live our lives, as I've said many times before, as Jesus showed us what communion was, to pour our lives out, to break ourselves, to give ourselves to other people. That's the way that he wants us to live. And so this morning, I want to look at how we're to build each other up. What are some specific ways? And since my kids have uh, been watching Bob the Builder for a very long time, if that will help you to identify, I want you to be Bob the Builder. And I, I, don't, I don't just want it for my own kind of, uh, my, my own desires or selfishness. I want it because that's what God calls us to do and to be as the church. And the first thing that he gives us to, to allow us to be a builder is he says that you have to be committed to it. Be committed. Be a group of people who are committed to building each other up. That there are going to be moments and opportunities and times to destroy and to tear each other down, to see the things and the items that aren't so wonderful in one another. And he says, no, I want you to build each other up. Can you imagine if we would embrace this? Imagine if even in, in E3, in this church community, if 30 people for for the next 12 months, every week, they wrote, a, they wrote a letter to one person just saying, hey, listen, I really appreciate you. I care about you. You mean so much. And, and, and you, you began to get in, in on this. And you not only were participating, but you were a receiver of it. How many of you know that emotionally, it would begin to reshape and change, and transform. And God says, this is what I want you to be as a church. I want you to build each other up. Look for the opportunities. Now here's, here's what, where some of us have probably struggled over the years, is legalistic Christians, people who follow Jesus and who use rules and regulations to be the shining glory of their success. And we know this, uh, that, let me define it, a legalistic Christian is someone who rather than seeing the relationship as the key element of the Christian life, they see rules and regulations as the key to the Christian life, right? How many of you have ever experienced that? Now, before you toss yourself out of that mix, it's very easy, and as Paul describes, that those people who were talking about diet and they were talking about days of worship, and they were talking about drink, for them to do the exact same thing. Some were, were wanting to worship on Saturday, some on Sunday, and, and at the end, if you read through Romans 14, you know, Paul's like, eh, it's just really not that important, guys. And some, whoa, hold on a second. It's really not that important. Well, we, we do it this way, we do it that way. No, it's not really important. You know what's really important? is Jesus. Jesus is really important. <laughs> like, love is, like, really important. But these, these types of things, they're not so important. The Bible tells us that legalistic Christians are weak Christians. Oftentimes, we've missed that. I mean, I used to, when God called me into the ministry, I was like, really, God? Because there are some people that, are, that I look at in, in the Scripture, and I see as Pharisees and Sadducees, and they just always want to be, they, they almost, like, they, they fight to be on the platform, and I, I, don't, I don't want that. Like, I don't want to be like that. And God kept speaking to my heart, and I'm like, I'm just not in on this, this type of situation. And, and I was just like, just let them. They're going to win. Let them win. And God began to speak, and he said, Brad, you know, if, if we don't have a group of people who understand the reality of my love, where, where will the church be? For far too long, because legalism has seemed stronger, the person who says, listen, I, I can quote the, the entire New Testament. I know Greek, Hebrew. I have plenty of you know, theological degrees and things like that. And we, we felt intimidated. Have you ever felt intimidated by someone and how much activity that they've done that you're like, I just can't live up to it. But deep inside of you beats a heart that cares about, that's compassionate towards others, that 
it has a heart for mercy and for justice. And you've thought to yourself, man, you know, how, will, how will I express this because these other people seem to be winning? Well, one thing to understand is that legalistic Christians, they need to grow in the knowledge of the grace of scriptures, right? They need to be able to grow in their understanding. Now, on the other hand, maybe you're not hung up on rules and re- regulations, but maybe you need to grow in love and limit some of the things that you are doing so that it would benefit other people. Because I have been in all of these camps. I've been in the legalistic camp because I joined the church, and, or I should say got involved in ministry, and I thought all my friends all of a sudden went from being uh, playing uh, baseball and, and uh, a party crowd in high school to then going into uh, Bible school and all those people. Like, it was like the same thing. You know, if, if somebody was, was taking a, a taken a, I, yeah, I better watch out, taking a hit, okay, of, of something, some substance. You know, when I went to Bible school, they were taking a hit of Jesus, and it was not in a good way. I mean this. I mean, like, they were, they were creating this, this fix on, on religion, and it wasn't necessarily life-giving. Are you with me? So I went through both because it was like positive peer, peer pressure, and maybe one wasn't as destructive as the other, but it was still destructive. And so then, then I came out of that to begin to discover who I was in Christ, and I began to discover my freedom. And so people who didn't understand their liberty and the grace of God, I, I, I began to, to shove what my freedom was in their face. Ha! Look at this. I can do whatever I want because Christ has set me free. However, the problem was that that wasn't necessarily the motivation of love as well. And so we start off to build others up by committing to do it. The second thing is that we have to see the value of every person. Someone say every. Every. I mean, Jesus died for the most crazy person you know and also the most legal uptight person you know. How many of you know that's true? And how do I know that? Because some of you were in both of those categories. I mean, Jesus, he died for you, and he died for them. And when you get to an understanding of that showcasing how valuable people are, then it allows you to recognize how important they are. And it offers you the opportunity to open your heart to love people and ultimately to come back to what God's desire for the church is, which is unity. You with me? Third is by keeping our focus on what's important. Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So he says the essence of Christianity is not external, but it's eternal. It's not not external things that make up uh, what we are and what we do, but it's, it's the eternal things. It's about Jesus. Because I have been involved. I have participated in churches that do all kinds of things. People who have flown banners. Bless them, Lord. Um, people who, who um, feel liberty to uh, have prophecy and speak out during service. Those who speak in tongues. Those who don't. Those who uh, are way into, what, I, mean, I mean, seriously into pre-millennial, post-millennial, amillennial, pre-trib, post-trib. I, I mean, I literally, as a young man, was like, all of this stuff, all of this minutia to, 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 you know, to go over. I like what one person said, I'm a pan-millennialist. It'll all pan out in the end. I mean, bottom line is, you know, I avail myself to the fact that no man knows the day or the hour, and I just would rather not spend my time in a conversation where, where it just goes round and round. But the truth is, is that people have all kinds of backgrounds and views. And, and what is so great about the scripture is that it, it, it cuts right to the heart. It shows us what's important, what God desires, that it's not about that. If you want to wear yellow shoes on Sunday, go for it. Wear, wear your yellow shoes. If you want to wear a hoodie, if you want to wear a suit, if you want to wear a clown outfit, great. I don't care. If you want to do triple backflips, as long as it doesn't disrupt everybody, okay, don't do the triple backflips, but, you know, whatever. 
I mean, I've traveled all over the world, I've, I've, and this will be new for some of you. I've been to churches in South America where people talk about how they, their mouths were filled with gold. Neat. I mean, I, I have not experienced that, nor really, it, it, that may shock some of you, like, or some of you may be like, yep, yep, my mouth filled with gold. Awesome. Uh, I've been to churches with rivers. I've been to churches where they drink from Joel's place. I have been to places where they laugh, where they do triple somersaults. Great. I, I, I don't judge because the first part of Romans 14 says what? Don't judge. But if we get into a place, because I've seen this happen, I don't know why I'm on this, but, but I've been to a place also where those people then take that thing that they've experienced, whatever it is, whether it's solemn or whether it's ridiculously crazy, and they say to other people, you must do this in order for God to love you. And that's wrong. That's not, that's not right. That's, that's not true. Because you know why? It discounts the finished work of the cross. Because it's about Jesus. Are you with me? Sorry to introduce you to all of that because some of you are like, what? What in the world? Yeah, welcome to the church, okay? Welcome to the church. Because everybody comes up with something different. But what God is after, and, and this is why we have so many different types of churches, so many sects, so many different you know, denominations, and all that God desires is that the church would be one. Jesus prayed, John 17, Lord, that the church would be one. Which means that you and I are going to have to have, by the love and grace of God, a little bit tougher hide than sometimes we think. That the super sensitivity sometimes that we tend to have when things aren't just like we've experienced it. Because why? Because that's the church that Jesus died for. Those are the people. The fourth thing is that we have to limit our liberty out of love for each other. Listen to this in 1 Corinthians 10, 23 through 24. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. See, let me give you a good example of this. Liberty that the Bible defines, some people understand their liberty in Christ, their freedom. They understand that it isn't about this or that or the other. But the Bible's pretty clear. It tells us, listen, you, you that get it, you that understand that there's liberty to do certain things, you that have that liberty, all that I'm asking you to do is out of love for each other, don't necessarily just parade your liberty with this sort of check me out, I'm cool, and I'm free in Christ Jesus, don't do that because you don't know how it affects other people. Those people might be struggling and you don't know it. So if it causes distress or it causes destruction in others, don't just do it because that's a mark of maturity. Now, that doesn't mean, and this is what we've heard, I don't, I don't experience the liberty that I have and then all of a sudden with it comes condemnation and, and guilt. And that's not true either. Are you with me? Two of you are with me. Good. I'll, okay, I better help this out. So the liberty that we have, that God's given to us, that we experience, is not for us to shove it in other people's face. It's for us to be able to experience and operate because we know it. Which means that from time to time, I limit my liberty because of love for other people, and maybe I experience that liberty in private, but I'm not trying to force my opinion on others because that is not the point of liberty. Liberty does not say, hey, I follow Jesus, check out what I can do. That's, that's, not, that's not it. Are you with me? That's why Paul gets into the conversation about drinks right? That's not the point, guys. That's, that's not it. It's not like, sweet, we're now this new group of people who can, we worship on Saturday. You worship on Sunday. You stink. You stink. We, we do this. We do that. Do you, do you understand, like, this is not the point? And God says, 
No, man, you're going to meet some people and you're going to miss out on these people because you're taking those things that you're saying are so important. They're not. They're not. And because you haven't worshipped in this way, and because you haven't seen that expression, therefore you're going to act like it's not about Jesus and it's about that. I don't know about you, but at this point in my life, I I don't want to just meet everybody who's just like me. I don't. I don't want to just worship. I mean, my most incredible experience ever was when I was in Peru and, and I, I came to the front of this church of about a thousand people and, and they started singing in Spanish and worshiping God. And man, I just felt, man, I just felt like the presence of God in such an amazing way. And I didn't even understand what they were saying, <laughs> you know? And, and when I look at you and I look at what the church, the value of the church is, it's people. I look at the gifts. I look at the opinions. I look at the perspectives. I look at the way that you see things. I, I look at how God has has taken you and how efficient he is and all the stuff that you've been through and all the junk and all the hurt and all the, all the stuff, that he uses every bit of it for his glory, for his goodness, for his grace, to make you a trophy of his grace because his desire is to shine through you, right? His desire is to shine. But he gives us the instructions to be able to understand. I mean, Romans 14, 22. Listen to this. Romans 14. Awesome. You may believe there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but keep it between yourself and God. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something that they, they've decided is right. Boom. There it is. Right? I mean, there are certain things, right? Shooting people is not, I mean, it's pretty clear in Scripture. Uh, sorry, I don't know why I brought that up, but... There are things, there are issues that are not. And there are things that you've decided upon. But we can be mature about it because Romans 12, 18 says, do all that you can to li- live at peace with everyone. Everyone say everyone. everyone. Romans 15, 5 through 7, we'll close here. May God who gives this patience and encouragements help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus, then all of you can join together with one voice. Everyone say one voice. Giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you. (laughs) It's like, ouch. Accept each other (laughs) as Christ has accepted you. Ponder that for about 10 minutes, okay? Just think about that one. Think about what you know, what you have felt. You know, some of us, and I think myself included in this, when I began to step out and see from Scripture that God loved us, that he had value for us, that he cared about us, and we began to lay a foundation at the start of E3 Church, and and the Life Church is what we, our first original title uh, name was of the church, and we began to take John 10, 10, 10, which was, uh, you know, Jesus's mission statement, which is, I came that they may have life and life to the fullest. And over that time, I mean, I spent my time in a very large church environment and had, had learned to react and respond in a very specific way. And to, and to sort of, uh, in, in one way, I, I began to mask who I was. And over time, I began to, as God took us on a journey and walked us through, I began to open my life up and I began to really experience what the juice is of a church and people. And it's not like I I, I never one day, I mean, I I always feared that ministry would become a job and and it would become something that I did. And, And instead, God took me on a journey that ministry is not that. Ministry is not about a function of your job. Ministry is the overflow of your life. It's people. It is, it is an understanding of God's love for others. And so during that time, we've seen an incredible group of people come together. We've seen people that are, are able to respond to God's goodness, God's grace, God's love. Can I get an amen on that? Yes. Amen. And I'm asking, as we move forward, for that to, to be the force with which we continue. As we become one voice, as we, as we become one church, uh, someone said, said it uh, this week in, in 
a group that we had, uh, Noel and I and, and, and Martin, we, we, we went to a, uh, a life group with, uh, with Gateway, Scottsdale, and it was great. One, one person had made mention, they said, you know, in a day when churches are splitting and there's schism and there's division, for two churches to come together, for two churches to have a heart and passion to reach their city. And, and my, I mean, that's, that's awesome, isn't it? I mean, it really is. Some of you might know, no, but I mean, it is, okay? I'm just telling you it is. Because God's desire is, is always bigger than ours. God's passion and compassion is bigger. And God's going to lead us, guys. God is leading us. But he's going to lead us in love. He's going to lead us in understanding that as we recognize that sometimes, sometimes our first response you know, I've been in church a long, long time and realized that when, when we respond a certain way, I mean, sometimes we, we, we want everybody to make the perfect response. That, that, isn't, that isn't what I'm desiring. That's not what I'm seeing. I mean, that's not what I even see through Scripture. We have to sometimes wrestle with stuff. We have to, we have to struggle with it. That's, that's true. But then God brings us back to what his heart is, which is unity. And God's desiring to take us from glory to glory, the Bible says, to grow us and to open our hearts up. And I know it's scary, but I know that God loves you. I know it's different, but it isn't about the minutia. I know that it can be hard, but how many of you know that he's good? And he's faithful. And all that I would ask because I am not somebody who desires to control or make or push or force, is that you give God the opportunity to be able to move and for you to be able to see what he has in store for us. Because his responsibility is strategically positioning you and I for the maximum fulfillment of what God has for our lives. That is is what he wants to do. And it means that you and I are stepping into maturity. It means that you and I are going to open up our lives to, to situations that are unfamiliar, but allow us to respond in love. It means that just because we have freedom in liberty, that we recognize that because of it, and because of what we know is true, we hold it. But we don't get into an arena where we parade it and shove it in other people's face to force that thing. Are you with me? Right? I mean, does that, that's not of benefit. But we love people. Now, I said this to, uh, to some, some people this week. I was like, you know what? What I know about God, what, the freedom of, I, I've experienced, the real, reality of his love, you will never take that from me. The truth and the expression. How many of you believe this? You will never take that from me. Never. But if God asked me to love people, and he asked me to do something because he cares of our scope of influence so that other people could begin to experience that same love, then I am in on it. Are you with me? Unashamed, unabashed, I'm in. And God wants to use you, each one of you, to be able to love the people of our city. How many of you believe that? In a greater way, in a more fulfilling way, and, and he is going to do something that I can't even begin to imagine to sort of say. But I know that he's doing it. Amen? Bow your head, close your eyes with me this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Free to love, free to bestow grace, free to forgive, free to let go, free to experience the fullness of life, free. God, I thank you for that freedom. Lord, I'm asking that every single person here that who you've made us to be, not one of us is ashamed of it. What we've been through, Lord, help us to see 
that you take those circumstances and those situations, you take our trash, you make treasure, you take our mess, you give us a message. Father, to help us see that right now exactly who we are is exactly who you love and who you desire to use. Father, we let go of ideas and situations that cause us to sequester and section off and divide our lives from other people so that we can begin to experience the unity and the heart that you have for us. This morning, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, maybe you're struggling. Maybe it was a person. Maybe it was a church. Maybe it was a family member. What I don't know, but you've, you've been beat up and bruised, and it makes you feel mad. It hurts. I believe that God wants you to be able to respond with the truth of your emotion like David did. When he was mad, I know we don't sing this in church, he said, break their face, oh God, smash their teeth, and that would be a wonderful song to sing, but if you, you just feel like that, yeah, I feel like breaking some faces, smashing some teeth, and it's been hanging around for quite some time. And you want to experience the freedom and the fullness of God's love. I believe it starts with just being honest. And if that's you, and you'd say, yeah, that's me. Just lift your hand real quick and you can put it down. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm just gonna pray a simple prayer. And then we're gonna be dismissed, but I want you to just believe with me that God would begin to open your hearts and allow you to see the situation from a different perspective. See the people who, who have hurt you in a different way. Father, I thank you for every single person that is here. God, for circumstances and situations and hurt and pain, things that are unfair, things that should not have gone down like they've gone down, Father. I'm, I'm just asking that you would begin to allow us to see those people like you do. The reality that you gave your son for even those people who have hurt and who've maimed and bruised. God, I'm asking that you would lift up our eyes to see the situation anew, to free us from the prison of the past hurts and pain so that we could begin to give and to let our hearts and our love and our life shine. I know the enemy has tried to work and hold people back, good people who, who are compassionate and full of mercy. We come against anything that the enemy has tried to bring against any person in here, Father, and we uphold the reality of your love and your goodness and your grace. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. This morning, I'm, I'm just gonna, we're going to, there it is, just gonna let you hear, I think it'd be nice, uh, invite Cody to come on up here, and he is just gonna break it down for us. And I want you to just open up your hearts to just listen to the, to the words that he's going to sing. And uh, then we'll close out. And why should I feel discouraged? And why... Do the shadows come? Cause when Jesus is my fortune, a constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. Oh, God's eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me.